This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As you continue with part two of our conversation with Kale Akuno, co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, a network of worker cooperatives in Jackson, Mississippi, longtime organizer with the Malcolm X grassroots movement. His new book, Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi. So you've just come up from Jackson, and you're going back home to Jackson, Mississippi. We were just speaking with Chokwe Lumumba, the uh, mayor of Jackson, um, uh, about the opening of the Civil Rights Museum, about President Trump being invited by the governor of Mississippi, which led to boycotts of so many black leaders of the very museum that they so supported, yeah, but right, since yeah. Trump was there. Can you tell us, actually, what happened in that week, the same week of the special election um, that was taking place in Alabama that led to Doug Jones's victory over the accused child molester, uh, Roy Moore? Well, I, I think to really put that in context, we got to talk about Phil Bryant a little bit. Phil Bryant is the governor of the great state of Mississippi. Um, he's a Tea Party member, uh, ultra conservative, you know, libertarian. Uh, very much believes in uh, Tina. There is no alternative, uh, and is doing everything he can to um, also stealing that phrase to, to drown the, the, the state government um, in the bathtub, right? To, to make it that small. Uh, but he's also uh, one of the most, I think, strategic. Uh, thinkers uh, in this new era of kind of white supremacist uh, uh, politicians. We call them neo-Confederates, right? Um, and he's made a habit uh, over the last several years, if folks want to go back and look at it, he's made a habit of doing what he, what he just did with Trump. And that habit is typically doing, you know, every year there's some kind of uh, state invocation of Black History Month. Um, and almost at every single occasion when there's Black History Month, he always announces Confederate History Month, right? He takes the opportunity to announce that in February during Black History Month program. And it's called Confederate History Confederate, Month? There's Confederate History Day and then there's Confederate History Month. And he always announces this almost every single year. So for those of us who, who live in Mississippi who are familiar, that his announcing and, and inviting of Trump, you know, uh, to this ceremony, was no surprise. It's, it's part of his M.O., it's part of his strategy, it's part of his game plan. The ceremony that would open the Mississippi, the Mississippi Civil Mu Rights Museum. Museum. So, just to put that in context, so—and and I think it also should be, be known to the, to the audience that he had extended an invitation to Trump, you know, to come to Mississippi on several different occasions. And as far as we know, he actually extended an invitation for him to come to the museum. Now, it just didn't break national kind of news until Trump actually accepted, right? And he accepted while he was doing kind of his, his tour in support of Ray Moore. Uh, Roy and Moore. so it was like, Roy Moore, uh, uh, he accepted that to come on down uh, and to try to offer some statements to kind of issue some clarity. And that just erupted, as it rightfully should, uh, in a major pushback, in a major protest and boycott in many sectors, you know, of Trump, not of the museum, so folks are clear, not of the history, but of Trump really going there and desecrating the very memory of those who made the sacrifices that we were supposed to be honoring on that particular day of his historic opening. So we got to give some context to it so folks know. And I think it's important, because if you don't understand people like, you know, uh, uh, Phil Bryant, it's then hard to, I think, understand the movement that Trump comes from and what emanates and who his base is and what they're planning on doing and how they're executing, you know, all these draconian, you know, measures on state levels, not just on the federal Phil level. Phil Bryant, the governor of Mississippi, being a longtime supporter of Trump. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he was running around uh, earlier uh, this year, like in January and uh, the end of uh, last year when Trump got elected. Uh, saying that he might leave the state of Mississippi and go work for uh, number 45. And he was kind of using that really as a, like a like political bait in such a sense of like, well, y'all don't want me to leave, really. Now, some of us were like, yeah, please go. Just you know, get out of our hair. But, no, he, they've, been, uh, they've been allies, more probably strategic of, like, within the last 18 months than I think, you know, prior, because, me, you know, Phil Bryant was on the record in the early days of saying, he liked Donald Trump, 
But he wasn't sure that Donald Trump was truly committed to the neoliberal agenda that the Tea Party and others like him had. So there was a lot of questionings, and he had to do a lot of things over the course of 2016 to really prove that he was on the team. And so once he made some key, you know, uh, uh, moves, particularly once he got connected with Breitbart and Bannon, who Phil Bryan and some, him, some of his forces are, are allied with, that was, I think, a critical turning point where Bryan jumped on the team, gave his endorsement, and really started doing a lot of groundwork for Donald Trump in the state of Mississippi. Mm. And, of course, Bannon was playing a key role in the Roy Moore yes, race, right. came down several times, uh, pushed Trump to support him. Uh, you know, Trump had right. originally supported right. Luther Strange, of course. Right. So, the Civil Rights Museum, you had Merle Evers Williams, the widow of Medgar Evers. Um, the gun is in the museum that was used to kill mm -hmm. Medgar Evers, a just remarkable civil rights leader. She ended up coming because she didn't want to desecrate, that right. she wanted to right. honor this place um, right. that had been built after so many years, but wouldn't be seen together with right. Donald with Trump. Trump. And he spoke inside rather than outside? He spoke inside. He spoke at a small private uh, uh, engagement uh, with a list that was primarily composed of Governor Phil Bryant's kind of uh, invites, largely kind of campaign contributors and, and donors. And I think, as we were talking earlier, I thought that that was one of the more strategic moves that they could have made. Uh, I think they did some calculus that if, if they would have allowed Donald Trump to just be himself and speak off the cuff— he actually would have incited black voters in Alabama to turn out in even stronger, you know, uh, 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 numbers than I think was anticipated. They had done some calculus that was starting to look like, hey, we might lose this thing if this voter turnout winds up being high. So rather than incite people, I think they strategically just backed off and said, you know, let's just, we're here, that says enough. Uh, they can't make you leave as you're the president of the United States. So just chill out. Uh, let them have their demonstration, let them have their protest. Outside. Outside. Where a thousand people were. Yeah. And, and then, you know, we'll get out of this unscathed, and you can go on and you can support uh, Roy Moore, right? So I think that was a, 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 a critical thing. And that doesn't—and I'm not trying to diminish in any way or fashion the response of, you know, our people in Mississippi. I thought it was on point. I thought it was necessary. But we always have to look at the larger implications of strategy mm -hmm. of both, you know, our side of the equation and the other side of the equation. So, before we talk about what's happening in Jackson, um, I want to talk about Doug Jones's victory, because something very interesting happened. Uh, the Democrat winning—I mean, you hadn't had a Democrat winning in a quarter of a century right, right. before Shelby, when he was a Democrat, ran in 1992, then switched a few years later to mm -hmm. become a Republican, Senator Shelby. But— um, it seems that Doug Jones made a calculation at the end not to go for the, maybe, Trump-leaning undecided voters, but to go for the African-American vote, right. to really right. do a get-out-the-vote campaign, which is what right. activists have been saying all over the country. Your biggest enemy are the people who just—enemy to democracy is the people who just stay home, uh, and you have to galvanize people just to get out to the polls. Right. You don't right. always have to win over the other side. So, major black leaders came down to Alabama, and Doug Jones went all over with them. Um, and then he quotes Dr. Martin Luther King in his victory speech. Um, but now we see on Sunday night um, the senator-elect, Doug Jones, saying he will, of course, consider voting with Republicans on certain issues once he's sworn in to the upper chamber, also pledged to look for areas where he can work across the aisle. Um, uh, raising, leading many people to say, would he even vote possibly for the tax bill? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But what about these strategies and what it takes, you think, to form coalitions? What Doug Jones did well and what you're concerned about? Well, I mean, uh, those of us who were doing some homework knew that he already had leaned towards the blue dog Democrat orientation and tradition, right, which many of us call Dixiecrats. Uh, so in, I mean, in, he in, was the prosecutor in the 1963 yeah. Birmingham bombing case, the bombing of the Birmingham church, where four little girls were killed. He ultimately prosecuted those Ku Klux Klansmen right. decades later. Well, I mean, it's not to say he doesn't have any sense, uh, not to say he doesn't have any humanity, but I think we got to look at political calculus again. And his comments on CNN uh, yesterday 
clearly indicate he's thinking down the road towards reelection. And he's trying to position himself, you know, trying to be fair to him, he's trying to position himself in such a way that he could win the block of voters that he thinks are going to be those most likely and most consistently to turn out. And he's really appealing to that evangelical base in Alabama. The thing that I think <clears throat> we were hoping that he was kind of coming to an understanding is, A, number one, on pure ideological grounds, that base is never going to vote for him. It's just not going to happen. I don't care how much he panders to their issues or their agenda. They, they just fundamentally don't trust him, right, or anybody with his background and his, his history. But he sees that this is the most consistent voter voting block, and I, and I have to play to it. But what it speaks to is, I think, a deeper lack of strategy, uh, uh, particularly on, on the side of Democrats and, uh, Democrats and progressives, which says, we have to turn out folks and we got to reach folks, you know, that, that the new kind of silent majority who, who don't vote, who don't see anything to vote for, because nobody's speaking directly to their issues, to their material interests and concerns. And if you just keep playing the middle, you're going to keep alienating those folks and they just see in their day-to-day -day reality, Democrat or Republican, I'm still feeling the burden of there not being any jobs, there not being any social services, there not being much by way of, of educational access for my children or, or for the future. So why should I turn out? It's just the same thing over and over and over again. And I think his statements on uh, Sunday negate all of the statements to a certain extent that he made just the, 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 the Friday, the, the previous Friday. And I think the thing that folks have to be deeply concerned about is it just plays itself again as politics as usual, right? And this is the same old thing. And particularly in the black community, you can already hear a narrative. We turned out for him and we are abandoned by him yet again. I mean, it was 98 percent of African-American women voters voted for Doug Jones. 63 percent of white women voters mm -hmm. voted for Roy Moore, even with the, uh, you know, child molestation right. accusations right. against him. Right. 63 percent, actually the same number nationally of white women who voted for Donald Trump. Right. And Well, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work, uh, I think, to move the white women who are voting in these elections because they're voting on the basis of some particular interests. They do not necessarily represent the vast majority of white women in the country, because, again, that's also a population that's just basically staying at home, not voting. So what is going to reach them, right? And this is something even in the local situation with us in Jackson, we've been trying to aim at for the last couple of years of saying, you know, typically in our, just on the local level, doing our calculus, it's about 40 to 50,000 people who vote consistently year in, year out. But there's 80,000 people who are technically registered to vote who don't show up. And so how do we reach that, those 80,000 people? And what we've been arguing for, you don't reach them by just doing the same old, same old. You have to reach them by actually trying to develop a program that speaks to their direct interests and would put them as a center actors in the transformation and the change of what's going on. And that's, that's easier said than done. But I think, to a, I think it speaks to an orientation that we would like to see you know, new forces on the political scene take up throughout this country. And I think it will lead to some some profoundly different results of what we've gotten the last 16 years. So let's talk about that, Jackson rising. Um, first, talk about how the tax bill, Trump's tax bill, while he says it's a Christmas gift to the middle class, what it will actually do. Um, it is an historic bill. There's no mm -hmm. question about mm -hmm. that. And then what you're doing in Jackson. Well, I mean, starting with, with uh, not just the Trump GOP uh, tax bill, I think, if we can, let's step back a little bit further. And I think we have to see this all as a fulfillment of the neoliberal dream strategy, which is actually not over yet. I think they're just really revving up for it, and I think they, they feel 2018 is really their, years to, their year to make some profound changes before either the House or the Senate makes some major, you know, adjustments. But if you look at the whole strategy and how they've been setting this thing up, so just speaking about one particular issue around health care, we know they did several votes this year that basically failed to repeal the, the Affordable Health Care Act. 
Trump has been very clear and very obvious that if I can't defeat it legislatively, I'm going to kill it by eliminating all of the different subsidies that the federal government, you know, uh, is responsible for, which actually make it affordable, right? Mm -hmm. So he's been cutting those left and right. So how would it affect you, for example? Oh, for, well, for me, I mean, it already affects me. I, I uh, unfortunately have a heart condition, which requires uh, me to be on a couple of di different medications probably the rest, the remainder of my life. Uh, and that puts me in a pre-existing condition category, which they've been uh, just straight up trying to eliminate. Uh, and in the state of Mississippi, we went from the beginning of the health care markets, I think, to, if my memory serves me correctly, five health care providers that were in the market. Four years later, it's down to one. Mm. So I'm now stuck with one option. I basically have, you know, no other place to go other than to move. And once I just recently, me, you know, for me and my family, we just applied uh, throughout the remain throughout this year, 2017, we were paying roughly $900 a month. You know, for health care and some additional, I think, one hundred and fifty dollars a month for for dental. Under this new calculation, without the subsidies and in my limited income, which is not you know that great, and our family's income, not the combined income, is not that great. We are now being charged with paying two thousand dollars a month <laughs> from. From from the new health care provider. From what you had um, before. From what we had before. So it, 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 And what did you have? What were you paying before? Nine hundred dollars a month. So more so, than double. More than double. Um, which means on my family's limited income, which is roughly about five thousand dollars a month, uh, you know, which for a lot of people in Mississippi, uh, that that would be well to a to a certain extent, but that sink in. Um so I'm roughly paying one third uh, of my income, my monthly income, uh, in health care if I follow through on this plan. And I, I'm a bit better off, <clears throat> in a bit better position than a, a vast majority of black folks in the state of Mississippi. So if this is how it's going to impact me, imagine what it's going to do with folks who only have one income or folks who, you know, in some of the poorer regions, say up in the Delta and some other places, who have no incomes, right? Uh, it's going to be devastating. And there is, then you have to, to uh, add that to over the last three years, the Tea Party has basically defunded the state of Mississippi with all the tax cuts that it has been implementing, that the state of Mississippi is already now deeply in a debt hole that it, it is trying to kind of crawl itself out of. So there's no uh, support on the local level or the state level coming to provide any additional subsidy for the health care markets or, or any other tax breaks. So, you're compounding, you know, layers and levels of just forced austerity. Like, this is really what's going to happen in Mississippi in the next couple of months, in the next couple of years. And Mississippi is just one of many places. I mean, I can speak to it because that's where I live. But same in Alabama, same in Tennessee. And I would, would, would argue it's probably the same here in the, in the rural parts of uh, uh, New York. So, what is Jackson Rising? Uh, what are you doing in Jackson? How are you going to take on the starvation of the cities and states, forcing mm. uh, these cities and states to cut back on government spending, on important programs that support people? Well, that's a good question, Amy. Um, I can tell you what our aims and objectives have been over, over you know, a course of time. Uh, and the, the, the overall kind of political project and strategy that we've been working on is, is we call it the Jackson Cush Plan. And, and the ideal piece of that is taking, uh, at least in the western part of the state, the numeric majority of the, the black population in, in several counties, using that as a, as a form of political leverage. And over time, and through work of, of building up the solidarity economy, transforming Mississippi's economy, starting in Jackson, but transforming from the inside out. Uh, that was the long-term strategy. And with that, uh, we had made some very clear, clear calculations that we need to recruit and ally ourselves with a certain number of white progressives in the state that we hope to, to you know, nurture and develop. And with that calculus, we saw maybe within the span of 10 years, this is going back to 2006, 2007, that by 2025, a new progressive alliance could take over the state of Mississippi. Now, that was the projection. I still think a lot of that is very possible, very viable. But the other side of the equation have done some things to make it far more challenging. And then we did not anticipate 
because uh, uh, you can't see everything. We did not anticipate a Trump emerging on the scene, right? Uh, we, we anticipate things moving further to the right, but there are degrees of how that rolls out. And I think Trump is the worst of the kind of the Goldwater revolution coming to, in, to fruition, uh, which is deeply racist, you know, deeply misogynist, uh, deeply xenophobic and neoliberal to the core, and you add all that up, you, it's a very vicious mix, which we're now, and, and uh, dangerous, I should add, uh, that we're now, you know, living through. So, on the, on the local level now, honestly, there's a period of kind of recalculation that we're trying to figure out and, and go through. Um, you know, as you had Chokwe uh, Antar Lumumba uh, uh, on the show, I think twice here uh, recently, um, right around the time he was, um, he became mayor. He mm -hmm. was inaugurated July Fourth weekend. Mm -hmm. um, he right before that he had spoken in Chicago right, at right. a big People's right. Summit rising, and then now talking about right. the museum and his boycott. Well, he's in a he's in an unenvious position, you know, uh, because um, the the terms and conditions that I think he's going to have to to battle and, and, and navigate from his position at mayor are far worse than what his father. Uh, had to deal with the, the the conditions in Jackson and the conditions in the state have deteriorated. Like I said, the the, the state is in deep debt, the city is barely out of debt, and if you look at kind of the long term uh, uh, infrastructure projects that we you know have to comply with, both with the EPA for our, our water delivery system, and then there's other ones which are within the wings. Uh, we have some major challenges we're going to have to figure out. Now, from my vantage point, you know, uh, uh, I don't have the burden of uh, of having to administer and having to be in government, I'm on the social movement side of the equation. You this time. run Cooperation Jackson. I'm one of the co I'm one of the people. It's a, it's a collective, but one of the co-founders of it. Uh, on our end, uh, we have, I think, a bit more freedom to experiment, but we have the challenge of where do we, you know, how do we access resources to do the development projects that we're trying to do. So, we've been very clear that first and foremost, we're trying to draw existing resources within the community, first and foremost, for us to pay our own way, uh, because we don't have, you know, uh, progressive philanthropies in, in Jackson that are willing to support working-class black folks doing almost anything. Um, and there's not a lot of, you know, capital wealth, but there is a tremendous amount of talent. There's a tremendous amount of energy. So it's like, how do we balance our assets? And so trying to organize folks to do autonomous development, starting with the basic skills that we have, first around agriculture and around, you know, other food. But we're also trying to be as forward-looking as possible and in getting into digital fabrication, what we call uh, community production, and really trying to link those two to be able to create as, as much as possible a solidarity economy, which can be, you know, mediated by as much through mutual exchange and trade as it is by cash. And that is a very important element for us in a place where it's a cash star of economy, but there's also a thriving solidarity economy that already exists that we don't have to organize. The question is how do we formalize some of those relationships that we're working on and how do we build them and extend them so that they, they're not just little pockets of people who are helping themselves, but how can we build to scale so that we're doing this citywide? Mm -hmm. We haven't figured it all out, but we're working on it. So, this issue of solidarity economy, I don't mm -hmm. think most people have heard that term. Explain what you mean. Solidarity economy, um, you'll probably hear different definitions of that. But for us, what it means is trying to develop relationships that are not mediated by the logic of capital. Now, what does that mean? A bunch of fancy words. What does that mean? It means, first and foremost, I don't view my engagement with you or anyone else as purely transactional, that both of us have, when we come to the table, some intrinsic value, and we should find ways to exchange as equals within that relationship. So I don't reduce everything down to how much money you have in your pocket or how much money I have in my pocket, but I try to create a dynamic where we're sharing and we continue a process of sharing, we continue a process of being in solidarity with each other to meet both of our individual needs, but more importantly, a communal need. Uh, and for us, we think this is important, just given the history of, of the, the black working class population that we're trying to organize with, to try to move people out of long-term exploitative relationships, of which they're never going to really, you know, get ahead of trying to compete in the market, which is so 
uh, unfair, so uneven, and you're so disadvantaged from the day you are born almost to the day you die, no matter what you do, how much education you receive, you know, how many, you know, social benefits you might receive, if they're even available, you know, from the struggles that we, we have amassed to, to get ourselves to a point where the government is trying to take care of some things socially. So doing that. And so for us, um, what we're trying to do, uh, uh, Amy, is in a place where it's been deindustrialized, you know, some 30, 40 years ago, we know where capitalism is at right now. It's not aiming to produce any new jobs. If anything, automation is accelerating it in such a way that there's going to be fewer and fewer jobs. So we're starting with what are the things that we can do within our own community, within the resources that exist, to improve the quality of life. And that starts with first organizing ourselves to understand there's, you know, if we don't help ourselves, no one else is really coming. There's no great savior that's coming. So how do we take the resources we have, pool them together, and create a new system? You know, and that's what we're doing. And right now, what we've been really concentrating on uh, is really trying to create somewhat of a closed loop. Uh, so for us, that we we started very intentionally on doing urban farming, uh, doing some minor food production with the cafe and, and catering co-op, and doing some regenerative work in in terms of recycling, composting, and lawn care. And and those three are the kind of the basis or the anchor of our kind of revolving network where they they support each other with waste being transformed into organic matter, which which helps to stimulate the food production. And they're all sharing in in common resources and in, in common income. Uh, in such a way that boosts that particular economy and creates jobs. And you're and talking about being organized as co-ops, as, as worker co-ops, co -ops. Yeah, and as explain worker co -ops. what that means as a model. As a model, what it means is a group of, of individuals come together, they pool their resources to start a small business or, or a large-scale business, depending on how many uh, uh, come together, but they pool their resources, number one, together, and then they create a democratic structure by which they manage the enterprises together. So there's no boss other than themselves acting collectively, telling them what to do, what their hours are, you know, what their working conditions are. These are things that they determine themselves. That's the central core component of its collective ownership and collective decision making that makes it a, a, a real workers' cooperative. And do you see this as part of a national and international movement? We do. Uh, we also see ourselves as trying to be a force trying to stimulate that in other communities. Like here in New York, there's already a thriving kind of cooperative, you know, model. I think for us, for like in New York and other places, what we're trying to do is not just do business for business sake, but to have it have a very explicit social mission, which is about liberating people. And so there's a infusion of politics that we've been very intentional about trying to, to you know, uh, put at the center of our uh, process and politics within the, the Jackson model. And we're, it's not necessarily, it's not ideologically neutral, let me be clear with, with, with everybody on that, uh, but it's not, uh, as we say, it's not monolithic. And, and uh, for us, what we've been telling folks is that, you know, we, we are, co Cooperation Jackson, if you want to break it down, is a collection of anarchists, uh, socialists, and liberation theologists, you know, trying to figure out how to work with each other in a democratic manner. That's really what we are, and we got all the bumps and bruises to prove it. And finally, uh, as you said, you're surprised, uh, could not predict the rise of Donald Trump, which, mm -hmm. as you describe it, racist, xenophobic, neoliberal, um, misogynist, and what that means from the protests in Charlottesville against the uh, white supremacists who marched there, right. and Donald Trump siding with them, talking about the fine people on in both sides in Charlottesville. <laughs> Um, what th this has unleashed in the country and how it affects your work? Well, again, stepping back, I think we have to look at the evolution of this. And this has been a long progression that I think took a qualitative turn uh, during uh, Obama's presidency. And we should not forget, you know, all those demonstrations uh, that happened by the Tea Party and other right-wing forces that had, you know, Michelle, uh, you know, looking like a gorilla, that had, you know, uh, Obama in effigy with him being hanged and all the history of, of that association. And that had been building up over time. 
And to a certain extent, you know, if you look at uh, CNN and some of these in, in particular, they were given audience to this, even though some of those demonstrations might have only had 40 people. But we went through four years where they were giving tremendous amount of free press to that whole development and really, in a certain sense, legitimizing it as, as a, 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 a rational form of opposition to uh, Obama. When on the other side of the equation, we would have gatherings that were more uh, uh, left of center, if you would, or progressive, that would hardly break, you know, uh, any news. I remember when I was at the uh, social forum uh, in Detroit, and there was over 10,000 people there. We got, like, this amount of uh, uh, coverage uh, on CNN, but then there was, like, two whole weeks of maybe a few hundred people demonstrating here or there for the Tea Party, and it was all over the news. And I think the large impact is that that wind up rationalizing and justifying and normalizing the racism that we now see apparent uh, uh, under Donald Trump. And I think Donald Trump's brilliance, and I have to, uh, you know, I hate to say that, but I think his brilliance uh, during his campaign was recognizing the shift and playing to the shift. And so he altered the rules of saying, I know the tune and the music, and I hear it out there, and it's, it's clamoring for you know, some simple rationalizations on why, in particular, the standard of living of the white working class is declining, right? So he was, I think, at least honest enough to, to recognize that, but then came with these xenophobic and, and nationalist uh, solutions, which are not going to work. He knows they're not going to work, and that wasn't the point. His point was, how do I galvanize all this anger, all of this energy to get me to a certain particular place, i.e., the presidency, where I can then just move uh, um, both my own personal agenda, which is continuing to get rich very clearly, but then also he allied himself with the religious right and the most, you know, hardcore the neoliberals to form a new coalition that's going to just ramrod, you know, their agenda uh, on on all of us, right? Um, because, and I say all of us, because the white working class base, which may or not, may not support him, I think that the, too much has been made of that, and it's really a lot of middle class forces that elected him, I think, truth be told. But the white working class right now is kind of getting the blame for that. But to the extent that there are, are supporters amongst that uh, uh, core group of people who are Donald Trump supporters, within the next six months to a year, as they start feeling the pain of not having access to health care, of seeing their taxes actually increase because they're, you know, the bracket that they're in, social services getting cut, I think many of them are going to wake up to a new reality that, hey, this agenda is not working for me, and we need to try something different, something new. The question is, from my vantage point, this is a longer question, a longer dialogue, are radical and progressive forces going to be organized enough, prepared enough to offer a real alternative when the opportunity passes? Kali Akunu is the co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson, network of worker cooperatives in Jackson, Mississippi, longtime organizer with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. His new book is titled Jackson Rising, The Struggle for Economic Democracy and Black Self-Determination in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, he is speaking about the book on Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Restoration Plaza in Brooklyn. That's Tuesday, December 19th at 6 p.m. This is Democracy Now! To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.